Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Sex is the life force energy that runs through us all. The link between sex, creativity, and the sense of aliveness is strong. Can you use sexual energy for your spiritual evolution? Or perhaps for emotional healing? Is it even possible? Clinical sexologist Dr. Martha Tara Lee will explore all these and more on the Eros Evolution Show here on Ohm Times Radio and TV. Hello, hello, and welcome to Eros Evolution. This is Martha, your host, and I have with me a guest. Her name is uh, Valentina uh, Tudose. Uh, is a transformational relationship coach and clinical hypnotherapist based in Hong Kong. Um, she's passionate about educating and empowering her clients to communicate effectively, learn more about themselves, and to create positive, deep, meaningful relationships with others. So in her coaching and uh, talks, she focuses on uh, teaching communication, relationship and intimacy skills and uh, provides strategies for conflict resolution and emotional management. So her clients will range from teenagers looking for their sense of identity to young adults exploring first relationships, singles of any age looking for real love and couples wanting to enhance their relationship or struggling with lack of intimacy, breakups, or infidelity. She believes educating people of any age on how to love themselves and others is a fundamental aspect of modern life. And so she's often giving uh, lectures around sex, consent, effective communication, and the intricacies of romantic relationships. Uh, she's actually a popular presence in many local, that's uh, Hong Kong, and a global publication. She writes a sex column in Mary Claire magazine, uh, dating and relationship columns in Hong Kong Living and Honey Comers, and is often interviewed in uh, South China Morning Post and uh, various podcasts and RT Hong Kong. So you can find her at uh, The Real Queen Maker on Instagram and also uh, her name, uh, Valentina uh, to those so look for her on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. So yeah, today's uh, title is uh, "What's Love Got to Do with It." So happy Valentine's Day to everybody, and happy Valentine's Day to Valentina. Happy Valentine's Day. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. I hope you had an so amazing time. If you're already in Asia. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so tell me a little bit about the name Valentina, right? Because like, is it like? An it is Valentine. my real name, believe it or not. Yes, it is uh, is definitely my real name. And um, to me, the way I look at it now, um, obviously, when I was born, the, the job of a relationship coach didn't exist, especially because I was born in Romania a long time ago. <laughs> um, so it had nothing to do with this kind of work. But I think I was uh, destined to be working uh, in the service of Eros. <laughs> Yeah, and to be um, a queen maker. Well, that is that is something that came a little bit later, and um, the the whole uh, nickname, my whole uh, Instagram ID, is really because I specialized in working with women. I'm passionate about helping women um, find the confidence and self love because I've been on this journey of. Uh, discovering how to love myself more. Um, so just to uh, give it uh, a little uh, background, um, I called my company Happy Ever After when I decided to become a coach because I think so much of our ideas about love come from fairy tales and Disney movies and all this stuff that is somehow programming us to believe that we should all look for Prince Charming. So I thought, well, yeah, but I don't really want to be a princess. I think even though in the fairy tales, the queens don't have a good name, I think the queen is really the, the ultimate um, expression of a woman's femininity and uh, personality and identity. I'm so sorry about these uh, drilling noises. I live in a building where they've decided to do some improvements. If you can hear it, my apologies. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I don't hear it. Uh, so yes, I love what you're saying about princess and uh, queens and all that because I also went on a journey of uh, really 
uh, growing myself from this uh, princess entitlement that uh, I myself and I think some of my clients have to uh, really stepping into my, my power and uh, claiming the queen. So the thing about princesses is that they don't have any responsibilities. They just uh, look pretty, enjoy themselves. Uh, that's the perception. And wait for Prince Charming to come and rescue them. Whereas when you're queen, you can be a queen of a castle or you can be a queen of a kingdom. So I choose to believe that uh, I want to have my own kingdom, my own empire, and uh, to create a legacy. So uh, my third book is actually called From Princess to Queen. So for those of you who are interested, you can check it out on Amazon. Uh, so I'm very curious about your journey, uh, your evolution, um, stepping into uh, this uh, role of uh, supporting uh, uh, your clients, uh, especially women. So tell me more about how you got into this. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story um, because this is actually my third career. Um, I first qualified to be uh, a translator and a call, um, conference interpreter, but I quit that relatively quickly, not because I didn't like what I was doing, I loved it, but somehow the universe guided me into advertising. So I had a career in advertising for almost two decades, which brought me in contact with a lot of people, taught me a lot of things about psychology, about how to connect with people, how to um, really get your message across very much in the space of communication. Uh, and um, I enjoyed it. It made me travel all over the world and so on. So it definitely helped my personal journey of, of becoming uh, more empowered and uh, you know feel good about my feeling good about myself and then at one point um, it was literally in a conversation with my colleagues with my boss that somehow we were very very happy in that moment as a team and someone asked you know what would we all do if we didn't have this job that we love so much and for a very strange reason um, I just said oh I think I would like to be a relationship coach and I don't know about the rest of uh, the people that were in that group, but it really shocked me because I was like, whoa, okay, where did that come from? I don't even know if this thing exists. I don't even know if you can be a relationship coach, but it, it felt like a download, if you know what I mean, you know? Since this show is about spirituality, it was really like, uh, I, I kind of said the words that um, discovered my, my purpose. Um, there was a little bit of a backstory to that, which may be also uh, funny to share. <clears throat> uh, I moved to Hong Kong at the age of 30. I didn't have a, in fact, I didn't know anybody here. I moved with my boyfriend at the time. And what I noticed about Hong Kong, um, I don't know if this is the case in Singapore or wherever our listeners are, but um, Hong Kong is a very transient place. There's always people coming and going. They're, everybody is from somewhere else, at least in you know the kind of uh, expat community that I was planted in when I arrived. And um, I I had this distinct feeling every you know when a 30 year old woman together with some other 30 year olds hang out in bars or restaurants. We we had a lot of guys coming uh, to chat to us, and all these guys would start the conversation with the rather boring question, where are you from? Which is legitimate. I understand it makes sense in a place that is so cosmopolitan, but it felt lazy to me. It felt really annoying because it's not a really good introduction. If you really, uh, even now, for, as from the perspective of someone who's worked with flirting and uh, dating strategies, it's so lame. I still roll my eyes really when when people start off with that just because i think if you really want to attract someone's interest the best way to flirt is not to ask the most obvious question sure i don't look asian so obviously i must be from somewhere else right anyway so this used to annoy me and i thought i should i should have a flirting school clearly these uh, the population around here is lacking a little bit in terms of flirting skills and maybe I should just set up a flirting skill, but for many, uh, from a flirting skill school, but for many reasons, um, probably to do with the fact that I wasn't ready for this and the universe kind of redirected me towards going back into advertising, it didn't happen at the time. But um, about 10 years later, the message came loud and clear from the universe that I needed to do this, that this would make me happy. And um, yeah, that's kind of how the journey started. Um, and I think the, the motivation was also to do with the fact that a lot of amazing women that I knew um, 
you know, I could see that they felt a little bit like the princess, you know, what I call now the passive powerless princess, the, the person who just sits around uh, with no, no, with a lot of desire for a relationship, but with no uh, action, no, no strategy, no, I'm going to go out there and, and find, you know, something that I want. And what I've noticed now after eight years of doing this job is that this, the pattern that seems to be at play with, uh, with a lot of my clients is they don't actually know exactly what they're looking for. And for me, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. It's impossible to find something that you don't have clarity about. As I say to my clients, look, if, I, if you've never seen a pair of glasses in your whole life, and suddenly I asked you, can you help me find my glasses? You could be looking straight at the glasses that were sitting on my nose and you would still not be able to recognize that those were glasses, right? Yes. So I think the same with true love. If you don't really know what true love feels and uh, looks like, it's going to be very hard to, to find it. And then, of course, if you're not actually healed and ready and uh, you haven't done the work on yourself, it's going to be hard. So I did a lot of that work on myself so that I can now recognize what is what is love for me and what do I really want in a partner. Mm, that's beautiful. So what is love? If someone who doesn't know uh, what love is, how would you how would you explain it to them? For me, love is actually the biggest lesson we are here to learn. And it, it really is a process of discovering uh, ourselves through others. Uh, I know it sounds very unromantic when I put it that way, <laughs> um, because I think a lot of people's ideas about love is this magical feeling that we just experience once we find our other half but i really don't believe in that i think yes of course it is an emotion it is it is a bond that we um experience with another person that we are connected to someone else but at the same time i think there is a very um rational part to love uh, we we are essentially interdependent creatures we need to feel loved to feel special to feel chosen to feel like we matter and i think love gives us meaning so finding someone who can see us for who we truly are even though we don't actually know who we truly are is the way to really discover um this whole sense of identity that we have so i don't think there is one love of our life i don't think there is one soulmate i think every person who comes into our life teaches us something very meaningful about life in general and about ourselves yeah that, i agree with you uh for me uh like you said uh growing up i would uh associate love with those goosebump feelings those romantic mystical sensations that you experience with that one special person and uh, then as i grow up then i realized we can have connections with several people and also as i grew older I realized that i was um, attracting a lot of toxic dramatic passionate relationships and uh, that by itself wasn't sustainable and it wasn't healthy um so i i call it something along the lines of uh, addiction to drama and uh, mm. we, uh, we we think drama is passion and drama is love when in reality we can reframe that so for me now i think of love as the unconditional uh love that i experienced from my parents they uh, very thanklessly do all the things um acts of service to show me how much they provide and care and love me and a lot of time it is is uh is irregardless of what you're feeling uh, so i now think uh, love as a decision is a choice and uh, it's very much a commitment Definitely. so so what i uh, see with my clients I'm, I'm sure you see this also with them is that uh they say they fall out of love they're not uh, they, they're not in love with that person anymore even though they love that person they're not in love and uh, so then they think that they are just uh, not meant to be suddenly from meant to be is not meant to be <laughs> so do you have this kind of clients and how do you work with them a lot yeah of course i think again i'm sorry i think this is uh, something to do with disney you know and the the mindset that was created around romance and lust as being love 
people think that all you need is love, right? All these myths around love, that all you need is love, that love is in the air. Love is indeed in the air, but love is there to teach you a lesson, not to kind of, I don't know, take you to the moon and back. So I think this, um, this tendency that we have in our romantic society, like, you know, we live in the era of romanticism, as Alain de Botton says is, and I love his, his way of looking at love. Um, the romantics really have uh, <laughs> created all these very uh, interesting, but not very helpful, not very productive ideas and ideals for love. Um, I think you're right. For me, love is the perfect, uh, to, to find happiness in a long-term relationship, you really need to strike the perfect balance between chemistry and compatibility. And the chemistry is something that is given, is this lust and desire that we feel because it's in our genes pretty much. You know, we're biologically programmed to mate, to find partners that we become um, physically and emotionally bonded or tied up, attached, right? Um, but we also know that um, in order to, this, this uh, physiological bond that we experience through chemistry is not meant to be for life. We're not naturally monogamous creatures, not, uh, you know, in the sense of pair bonding forever. So once that part becomes a little bit diluted and the, the sexual uh, attraction and chemistry becomes uh, less potent uh, on a hormonal level, then what we're left with is the compatibility side. And the compatibility uh, really comes from a combination of values, like seeing the world through a similar lens, so to speak, having the same values, believing in the same things, um, understanding what it is that we need to be happy and being able to communicate those needs and requirements to our partners in a way that sustains the relationship as opposed to destroys the relationship. So it is definitely, um, you know, I think the the idea of a couple is a constant working progress, like a, a project that you have together, like a business almost. But I don't want to, you know, strip it of all the emotional beauty of being in a loving relationship. But you do have to work on it. I think the other myth that I see a lot with my clients is that, oh, now I'm now I'm married, I'm done. Now I don't have to put any effort into it. I just I just cruise for the rest of my life, which is, in my opinion, one of the biggest pitfalls of uh, of this mindset that we have around love, that we don't have to work on it. If we have to work on it, it's not love. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think it comes from that whole um, association of uh, uh, sex should be spontaneous and therefore it should be natural and therefore love should be natural. And so people don't want to put in the work. They don't want to put in a sacrifice. So so I do have a question for you. Like, What, what do you think of people who said like, uh, I had a failed relationship or failed marriage? Is there some other word that we can reframe it so that it's not, it's not like, you know, we say failed as in it's over. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I, I... I like to reframe the word failure to the word lesson. I like to call, actually, I think last week I did a short video on Instagram about the biggest lesson that I learned from my so-called failed relationships. I actually see these relationships that didn't work as wonderful gifts. And um, for me personally, the biggest lesson that I've learned from those relationships that didn't work was that you really need to say no to those things that you do not want in your life that don't work for you so that you can actually open the door and give yourself the ability to say yes to what you really want. You were talking just a, a few moments ago about attracting drama and toxicity. Well, I bet, I'm guessing, I'm going to take a wild guess here, that until you learn that you needed to put boundaries around those kind of people and those kind of relationships, you were not really able to, to find the kind of partners that work for you. Mm -hmm. And I also think that uh, when we are um, not confident and still finding ourselves, uh, we're just grateful, you know, for anybody who shows us any attention. So we just take the first person who comes along. Uh, but in my case, uh, I actually married uh, two of my soulmates. They just felt right. They felt like home. Um, but what happened with uh, both instances is that they didn't take accountability for themselves and they really uh, 
were more interested in uh, blaming people and uh, uh, not fulfilling their promises to me and also to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it was it was really impossible to work with someone um, and be on that life journey with them if they're not going to take accountability for their own actions. So yeah, despite the attraction, the connection, the past lives that I must have had with them, um, I just couldn't continue in that in those relationships. So I think the lesson there for me um, is we just can't listen to just our heart. We have to also use our mind to uh, make a decision about whether a relationship is working for us. Exactly. And there, the, the way to, for me, it's, it is also about looking at what gifts that person has given you you know the the gift of self-knowledge you you've become a lot more aware of what you absolutely must have in a relationship for it to function you've you've learned a lesson that just because someone feels right it doesn't mean they're going to be your soulmate for life and that you know you're happily ever after this whole idea that we have can actually happen but it doesn't have to happen with one person you can be happy for you, the, your whole life if you learn from these experiences and don't repeat the same uh, patterns. Because I don't like to call them mistakes. To me, the, a mistake yeah. is a mis once you, if you make a mistake once, that is wonderful if you look back and learn your lesson. If you keep repeating that mistake, you're, you're caught up in a pattern that you, you need to break. And when you break that, you, you've learned the lesson the harder way. Because I think Oprah said this once, you know, the universe keeps giving you the same, uh, the same lesson in a different pair of pants. Mm. If you don't learn the lesson. Correct. Life has a way of presenting the same lessons until we learn it. Exactly. And that's the beauty of it. You know, I think the universe knows best what we need. We just need to figure out what the lesson is in every experience. And I'm still learning um, exactly how my previous relationships the successful ones and the so-called fail ones or the ones that ended when they needed to end um it was uh, it was something that really helped me discover different aspects of myself so i'm very very grateful to those partners yeah okay so um uh, i guess moving along to uh, sex uh, do you think it's possible uh, for couples to uh, be in uh, sexless uh, relationships what do you see is the role of sex for me, sex is the relationship glue. It really keeps the connection, the intimacy uh, alive during a relationship. But I think each couple, there isn't such a thing as a normal sex life, in my opinion. Whatever normal means, I don't know. It's it's not something that we can quantify, at least in... I know we can we can look statistically at how often people are having sex in a particular given time, but I don't think that is in any way an indication of their sexual satisfaction or their happiness in their relationship. Knowing from my experience that a lot of women very often engage in sex with their long-term partner because they feel they should, that it's it's kind of a part of the marriage contract and you should have sex with your partner either because you want to keep him happy so that he doesn't stray or because otherwise it's somehow causing you different problems so it's more i think very often sex is used as a strategy to prevent infidelity and not enough uh, a strategy for creating intimacy connection and vulnerability uh, so is it possible to have love and no sex yes but is it possible to have a successful, uh, happy, long-term relationship? Maybe, <laughs> I would say. If both partners have a low sex drive and, or maybe you know, they have some sort of illness or issues, um, I think it is possible. However, I would also like to bring into question the definition of sex. I think for many people, and I, I know you see this probably every day of your life, um, at least that's my experience with my clients, people think that sex must be penetration and if we haven't actually very often my, my clients who are dating tell me oh i went out on a date and i'm so happy that we didn't have sex we did everything else but we didn't have sex i'm like what does everything else mean well you know we didn't have penetration i'm like excuse me but everything else is sex <laughs> in, in my opinion the definition of sex is is so much broader 
uh, than simply looking at penis and vagina sex. That's one way of having sex, but it's not definitely by far, by far, by far, not the only way you can have sex. So um, actually I have a lot of clients who are complaining that they haven't had sex for a very long time. And um, my work with them is, of course, you know, go to the doctor, check your hormone levels and all that, but also think about what is your definition of sex? What are your expectations about sex? Discuss with your partner what is an ideal sex life for them because we make a lot of assumptions around that. And we look at all these programs in society that says, oh, you have to have penetrative sex three times a week to be normal. I don't want to be normal. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, you, all the points that you just said. Um, there are people who do view uh, having sex in a relationship as a, a chore, duty, a way to please their partner, to keep their partner, to prevent them from stringing. And uh, I would like to invite them to reframe sex as something that is fun, funny, adventurous, creative, playful, and uh, mutual. Um, when we give away our power, yeah, when we give away our power and it becomes a uh, for them kind of a thing, then naturally over time, a resentment will build up and it's, uh, it may start off as a thought and then it becomes an attitude around it and uh, the body starts to respond in accordance to the way we think and frame sex to be and uh, we essentially are manifesting our reality. So yeah, body listens to what the mind is telling. And so if you keep thinking of it as something that is uh, laborious, something that is not wanted, a body will start to shut down. So it's really important to see as mutual because a lot of people actually uh, take pride in uh, uh, giving pleasure to their partner. So in order to give, you need to be willing to receive. But if you just see it as something that you are just absorbing, something that you're just tolerating, you're not going to be able to give your partner the kind of uh, uh, the gift of giving that they would love to have. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you um, about the definition of sex as well. Okay, so now we have a bit of a commercial break and I uh, will be right back. Home Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Own times. Open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I'm with Valentina Tudose from Hong Kong, who uh, in Hong Kong, who is a transformational relationship coach and clinical uh, high, uh, uh, Hypnotherapy. Oh my God, <laughs> it just kind of uh, stuck. Yes, so uh, check out uh, Valentina's uh, website. That's happilyeverafter.asia and uh, Instagram, uh, The Real Queen Maker. So yeah, uh, today's uh, um, title is uh, What's Love Got To Do With It? Uh, just now, before the break, we talked about what is love, uh, some misconceptions around love, and we also talked about mm -hmm. um, whether it's possible to have love without sex and this whole attitude a lot of people have around uh, sex being a duty, a chore. So uh, now I already want to move on to other uh, things around the link between uh, sex and relationships. So 
Uh, so, Valentina, do you think uh, it's possible to have a relationship without uh, sex? I know just now you said that uh, sex is like the glue in a relationship, but how about um, no sex? How would that work? I think it would be a challenge for a lot of people um, in terms of creating intimacy. I actually have worked with people who've been married for a long time and have not had a sexual uh, relationship for like 10 years. And... Um, several couples that I've worked with. I'm sure you've had this experience as well. Um, and I think the, the biggest uh, opportunity with these couples is really to define or to help them define or redefine their relationship to really understand what is going on. I know all of these people loved each other deeply. They were best friends. They had um, a lot of their um, relationship requirements were being met. In fact, all of them, they were meeting their needs for security, for safety. But I think for me, the, the biggest challenge in these kind of relationships is really building this em emotional intimacy and feeling seen as a sexual being, because I think that's such a critical part of our identity, you know, being desired. What I think disappears in these kind of relationships, or maybe was never there in the beginning, is a lack of sexual desire. And I think the way people understand desire is sometimes uh, very um, tricky in the sense that, as you said earlier, earlier Okay, Valentina uh, just got cut off or something. So let's hope she comes back. Um, yeah, so she was talking about Let's see if I'm okay, back. I don't know what's going on. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, you're back. Turn on your video. Sorry. Okay. Wait a second. But, uh, no worries. We'll get it back. Yeah, so uh, this is live and this is uh, what happens sometimes. Sometimes it happens like this, right? Okay, uh, so yeah, we were talking about whether it's possible to have a relationship that doesn't have sex. And uh, Valentina was saying that she has clients who uh, don't have sex for 10 years or more. And uh, I, do, do, I do see this in my work as well. I do work with a lot of people uh, with a lot of sexuality challenges, whereas I think Valentina works with a lot of people with relationship challenges. Not to say I, we don't work with clients with vice versa. It's just that I think... Um, more of where the problem is lying in the relationship, then they will seek support from us because of our specialization. So for me, my clients who are not having sex uh, are not having sex because they either do not know how, uh, cannot have sex, and um, there's a lot of uh, struggles around sex. So for, for me, in my world, it's not so much the relationship is stale, uh, but that um, um, uh, it's not so much the relationship is stale, but uh, more about... Uh, more about the the the, the innate uh, uh, struggles that people have uh, when they don't have sex education, they don't have sexual skills. So what I have learned from my clients is that uh, it's really uh, what I learned from my clients is that um, the sacredness of sex. Because as much as they they have the relationship, the strength of the relationship, uh, these difficulties around sex doesn't mean that they break the bond between them, doesn't mean that they start cheating or uh, end the relationship. They they value the importance of it, the 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 the, the sacredness, yeah. Because uh, sex by itself does have that uh, bonding ability, and uh, so. Uh, so yes, welcome back. So yeah, <laughs> so I've I've learned a lot about uh, um, appreciating how how sacred sex is from my clients. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So yes, coming back to just now. Yeah, I can't hear you. So now we can see Valentina, but we can't hear her. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, continue trying to uh, fix it. 
maybe because uh, there's a renovation in in uh, in her building. So another uh, thing that uh, we really want to go into what's love got to do with it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, suffering around sex because of the struggles that people have um, in their relationships. It can be with uh, in-laws, it can be around uh, communication, it can be around sex. So yeah, I work with a lot of people around sex and communication. Uh, so how do you uh, handle the lack of desire in a relationship? I'm more talking around uh, sexual desire. So Valentina, do you have an answer around this? Yeah, I think her internet is lagging. I think this sometimes happen. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to try to get some headphones. So how do you uh, handle the lack of desire in a relationship? I think a lot of people just like the feelings of uh, attraction, love is that they feel that it's either there or it's not there. If it's not there, then uh, don't touch me. So what I want to introduce is the concept of uh, spontaneous versus uh, responsive sexual desire. So spontaneous sexual desire is when you feel like it uh, and then you do it. So I call it feel do. You feel like it, you want to have sex. Uh, the other one is uh, people who don't really feel like it. So what's desire got to do with it? You don't feel like it, but you can try. What if you had an agreement with your partner that you don't have to feel like it, you just need to be willing to try? And then it's more likely uh, to result in a possible outcome. But also having the agreement that if I try and it doesn't work, I don't feel like it, I have the permission to spot, stop at any time. So so what do you think, Valentina? I think your sound is back. How can, can we, you hear me uh, now? Yes. How can we deal oh. with the lack of desire in a relationship? Well, as you said, uh, the difference with understanding that desire isn't always just happening magically and that we really need to prepare for that and be open. I think um, if people get more education around the idea that uh, desire after the first maybe few months, uh, let's say a year, becomes less of a natural, uh, spontaneous feeling that you have and more of a ritual, uh, to me, the way that I uh, help clients uh, resolve this problem, and actually I have uh, responded in that way or uh, used this technique in my personal relationships, was to really create uh, sexual rituals like um, agreements, conscious agreements that I've made with my partners about how are we going to get each other in a sexual mood? How are we going to communicate that, okay, it's time for us to reconnect? And creating your own sex ritual with your partner, desire ritual, intimacy ritual, I think helps uh, overcome that challenge of, you know, the fact that ultimately our biology, uh, once it realizes our body and our mind, once it realizes that we're not in this for procreation, it's sort of switching off this, uh, this production of, of sex hormones and it goes, okay, well, let's use this energy for something else. If you're not going to have a baby, why am I going to do this for, right? <laughs> That's how I, I think of it. Um, but of course, if we look at sex as, a, as an intimacy building um, activity, uh, we need to really approach it in a conscious manner and we need to really create the space for it. A lot of people put sex with their partner last in their list. I ask my clients a lot and I know from my friends and even myself, really, uh, I've had this situation before where honestly, the last thing in the world that I wanted to do was have sex with my partner simply because the other or simply because I was prioritizing other things maybe uh, or maybe because I wasn't uh, feeling very connected to my partner. I know in those times where the intimacy levels had dropped, um, it was much harder to really be interested in sex. Um, you may know uh, that I was in a relationship for 19 years, um, which at least for me is a long time <laughs> i don't know i mean i know a lot of people who've been in long-term relationships but um you know it, it it's experienced all the ups and downs over of a relationship that i started when i was 25 or 26. um so we really had to work on it and to talk about it and to decide how are we going to resolve this drop in interest that we had in each other 
Uh, and that communication really helped. I mean, ultimately, we, we did decide to open our relationship, but that was, uh, you know, also that contributed a lot to, to making things interesting in the bedroom, even between us. So it reconnected us very much uh, from an intimate perspective. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. So uh, uh, last uh, episode, I did uh, in invite somebody to uh, talk about polyamory, opening up the relationship. So in your personal opinion, uh, what is the difference between opening up a relationship and casual sex? Um, well, I think uh, it's really casual sex when you're within a relationship with someone else and have casual sex with another person. Well, first of all, I think it needs to be consensual, mutual, like both partners need to understand that this is happening. Otherwise, is basically defined as infidelity. Um, I think it really needs to be done in a very loving and, uh, and uh, compassionate way, as in I, I do coach polyamory. So I have clients who have decided to open their relationships. And I know from personal experience that it can be extremely challenging there 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 is no real book around how to open your relationship because when it comes to feelings and you know emotions is really hard to manage but it's for some people it's possible it's definitely not for everyone in my opinion um so the difference is first of all consensual mutual agreements around what is okay what is not okay uh how often you know what are the so people always ask me about the rules I don't know if um, one of the beautiful things about polyamory, ethical polyamory, is that it's a much more conscious way of approaching relationship. I think most of our, at least most of my friends and clients, um, subscribe to this given relationship model that is out there, um, prevalent in our society, and all the in, intrinsic or unspoken agreements that are part of the monogamous model. Uh, whereas in polyamory, at least people talk about it more. People discuss these rules uh, or then make new agreements about it. And I think that is really the critical difference. Uh, of course, if uh, one person tells me, oh, I'm in an open relationship, I usually ask, does your partner know? Because if the partner doesn't know, it is not an open relationship, it's plain cheating. If the partner knows, but they don't want to engage in, in uh, sex with other people, that's also possible. It's it's maybe a one-sided thing, but if that they don't have that need, I think it's okay as long as that agreement is not made out of uh, uh, let's codependency, right? Sometimes I know people agree to their partner having uh, multiple relationships out of a desire not to lose them, out of a desire to please that partner, but deep down they're very unhappy about the arrangement. So I think uh, if that is the case, definitely it's not going to work for a long time. And I think this is one of the reasons why there is this uh, common belief that polyamory can't work. That is essentially the deep reason why it doesn't work for many people, because they say yes to this, thinking that they're going to be able to manage, but in reality, their emotions are, are going to overwhelm the whole situation and create conflict. So, you know, again, only for people who I think are very secure in themselves. Casual sex is fun. And uh, I think there are many different levels of what people understand by casual sex. But again, we really need to consider the concept of attachment that comes in. It's, it's quite hard for humans and women in particular, but also men not to get attached to a casual partner. So if you know that those butterflies that you're feeling are actually desire and lust and not necessarily the love of your life, um, I think that's also an important um, element that we should consider. Yes, thank you so much for everything that you just shared about the difference between uh, casual sex and uh, polyamory, uh, a snapshot of what, um, and, and very well explained what it really is. I think... Uh, the whole premise of uh, being a good communicator, being a clear communicator, being able to articulate what you want, what you need, what you desire, being able to uh, not go into this uh, uh, over-responsible for your partner and actually just standing in your truth uh, are all uh, very important qualities. What I think a lot of people struggle is uh, is because of fear of hurting their partner, they, they stop themselves or they cannot express what they really want. And uh, then that results in a lot of um, 
second guessing and doubting a lot uh, a lot of drama so um the the whole point of why people go into a polyamory relationship is because this is who they are and uh, it's an important part of who they are so it is well worth the effort to navigate um this uh, uh situation for all parties involved so so we've almost come to the end of the um episode but is there anything else you would like to highlight about uh, what's love got to do with it well, the, the reason why I think this, uh, this is a, a good title for our conversation is um, what we've talked a little bit before, the, the misconceptions around love. And I think part of the, the reason why I'm so passionate about my work is um, that we don't really get relationship skills education, right? I, I've never been to a relationship skills school. Uh, and most of us are learning these skills and we develop our attachment styles very early on in our life, potentially from um, role models who also didn't know any better. So our whole experience, our whole um, you know, set of assumptions and programs around love are actually uh, not very productive for many of us. And this is a big uh, deficit, I think, that is uh, present in our educational system, the way we're teaching young children or teenagers to behave. Because I know I still learn a lot about love. So um, my, my biggest uh, mission and my biggest passion at the moment is really to try to reach as many people as possible. You know, I'm, I am a hypnotherapist but uh, most of i mean i use hypnotherapy in my practice to help clients resolve long-standing issues but uh, you know primarily i look towards the future with my clients i'm exactly i like to call myself a personal trainer for your heart because just like a personal trainer takes someone who's functional and you know in in a reasonable shape you know as in they are alive and they they survive and uh and helps them reach levels of, um, you know, performance that maybe that person never imagined possible before they worked with a personal trainer. And how do they do it is by creating a plan, a program, looking towards the future, constantly keeping an eye on the goal of that person and uh, personalizing the kind of exercises that they're doing. And this is exactly how I work with my clients. Ultimately, I start by assuming or uh, agreeing with the person where they are right now, creating a benchmark for their relationship or their relationship with themselves and, and the skills deficit that they have. So we identify that skills deficit and then uh, we work towards a goal. That goal may be to love themselves more, to become more comfortable in their skin, to, to be more confident in approaching other people and so on. Um, but then other people may come with the uh, lack of intimacy, lack of sexual connection and so on. So whatever the person's goal is, I like to create a personal program for them. And that really, um, I hope that this will fill a little bit of this gap. I mean, of course, I would like more and more of us to be around. You know, it's wonderful that we're collaborating today um, and possibly uh, many times in the future because I think there is such a big need for people to look at their love relationships, at their sexuality, at their sense of identity with a more conscious and a more um, insightful, uh, I think, point of view. So I love that you're spreading this, uh, this word out there um, and understanding that, yes, love is a big part of our relationships, but it's not everything. It's really... Um, this journey towards loving ourselves that I really, I really like to emphasize. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the work that you do. Well, I think we're, we're here to, to serve people to have more happiness and more love in their life. And I'm very, very delighted that I'm, I'm living my life purpose. <laughs> So I, I love what you said about a personal trainer for the heart and uh, the assessment and then the the personalized programs that you have for your clients. So how uh, um, like how can people get in touch with you? Um, 
the the best way to to check what I'm doing is uh, I actually have uh, two websites that they can uh, they can uh, visit. One is my my coaching website called happyeverafter.asia. Happy, not happily. Uh, H a p p i p b y. Sorry. Uh, and uh, as a as a side thing, a, a newly launched program uh, or a platform that I've created, uh, it's called happyeveraftercademy.com. This is where uh, I'm starting to expand on this purpose of uh, moving uh, more towards uh, filling in this skills gap. So on the Happy Ever After Academy. Uh, dot com. I have a bunch of programs. Uh, one is my signature program, which is about self-love, but also communication and meditation courses and so on. Um, I'm also on Instagram at the real queen maker. I mentioned earlier in the program why I believe all women can and should become um, queens or, you know, the most empowered version of themselves. But I'm also on Facebook at valentina.tudos, T-U-D-O-S-E. Um, so I probably Instagram and uh, happy ever after dot Asia is uh, are the, the best ways to reach me. Mm, thank you. So just to summarize, wrap up the whole thing, um, love to hear from you what kind of uh, Valentine's Day message you have for everybody out there. Oh, I think uh, my Valentine's Day message is really focusing on uh, loving yourself and discovering your own love languages. Um, I think if we all reframed Valentine's Day as a day of love in general, giving and receiving, not just from our partner, definitely not making it about roses and champagne and chocolates, especially here in Hong Kong, everything is closed so people could not go for dinner. There was so much distress in the streets. Oh my God, what are we going to do for Valentine's Day? Well, do all the other things that uh, you couldn't do and uh, definitely make sure that you are celebrating your love and your appreciation for your partner every day of the year not just on valentine's day mm. yeah so i would like to uh, also uh, share that i have a very similar insights to uh, valentina so i i just want to share a passage that i actually wrote yesterday uh so i just got to read it so there were times in my life I lost myself and I forgot who I was. And so I took myself on a weekly uh, solo discovery dates. So I basically made a commitment. Every week I'm going to go on this date with myself, by myself. And um, then I would ask body, body, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And then I would just let my body guide me. Sometimes I would drop the question into different parts of my body, whether it's my heart or whether it's my feet. And so over time, I found my way back to learning who I was and uh, what I liked. And uh, over time, I started to heal and then uh, started to fall in love with myself again. So this uh, would be my Valentine's Day message to all of you to keep going on the journey of uh, loving yourself, um, never forgot, forgetting how precious uh, you are and um, not uh, see love as uh, something that is outside of you, that actually love is something you can give to yourself and uh, celebrate yourself, honor yourself, play with yourself, literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> every day every day I play with myself in some way. Um, I do a silly dance every day. I am part of this close uh, Facebook group with, uh, with one other uh, lady. So uh, both of us just do one dance every day. And uh, that's just our commitment to uh, stay in our bodies and reconnect with our childlike wonder and our inner child and, 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 and also our need to express. Uh, so that daily reminder is a little bit of how, how I play every day. So it's, it's really, really uh, important to, no matter what's happening in the world, all the stresses that we're experiencing, then we never ever forget that we are the most important person in our life. No matter how much you love someone, you have to love yourself first because when you are okay, then everything around you will, is more likely to fall into place. Everything is uh, more likely to uh, happen more smoothly. And uh, so, yeah, so just to uh, wrap up, uh, do uh, follow uh, Valentina on her website. And uh, that's uh, happilyeverafter.asia. And then that's happilyeverafteracademy.com. And uh, the real queen maker on Instagram. And as for myself, 
uh, you can uh, go to my website, eros coaching, that's E R O S coaching.com. You can subscribe to my mailing list. So, people who are subscribed to my mailing list will get the most interesting, um, most confidential things because I consider it as a, like an inner circle. So, I um, do share a little bit more about myself that I wouldn't uh, publicly. And uh, yeah, you can follow me on Eros Coaching, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, DR Matali on uh, TikTok. And I do have uh, Eros Coaching on Telegram as well. Uh, but uh, to get the best of uh, this show, that's also Eros Evolution Show on Facebook and uh, Instagram. So do follow me, um, especially if you like this show so that you never miss a thing. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for... Uh, listening to this episode and we hope you get some insights about love and uh, re-delicate uh, your life to yourself. So this has been Martha uh, together with Valentina. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Goodbye Bye. everyone. <laughs>